Hey there folks, I am the Caffeinated Dad, content creator for Guild Wars 2. If you were watching this video, you were looking to get started on your Guild Wars 2 journey, and I mean to make that a little bit easier on you. I will explain your basic entry into the game, covering all the details of classes and race combinations, how to navigate your UI, the story, and the leveling experience, as well as some tips and tricks I've learned along the way. Lastly, I will cover the end game of Guild Wars 2 and what you can look forward to. So sit down, grab a cup of coffee and let's teach you something about guild wars 2. so the first thing that you will be greeted with is your server selection now in guild wars 2 servers mean significantly less when compared to other games such as world of warcraft just about every bit of content can be accessed regardless of what server you are on and joining with groups on, across different servers is not gated to server specific guilds. The only place that server selection really does make a difference is a PvP versus environment game mode called World vs. World. This is where the server divisions truly become important as for the most part you can only play with the server that you are a part of or paired with for that specific time period. But I will cover that more when we get into end game content. Next, you will be tasked with picking your character's race. Now you have five selections here, human, Azura, Norn, Silvari, or Char. Now, to be frank, the race doesn't really matter as much when you compare to, say, your class. The races do, however, determine your character's model, their personal backstory, and a handful of other unique race-based skills. Really, here, just pick the race that you think looks the most cool, honestly. So here is arguably the most important choice that you can make in Guild Wars 2. There are a total of nine classes, and each one of those nine classes has three subclasses called Elite Specializations. First, we have the Warrior, which is your typical melee specialist with breathtaking anger issues. Then the Guardian, which is a well-balanced class mixed with both supportive capabilities and offensive power. Then we have the Revenant, which offers an incredibly unique style of gameplay by channeling the historic legends of Tyria's past to gain power for a short time. Then we have the Ranger, which is a fantastic solo class as it has access to a pet companion who assists it in combat. Then we have the Thief, which is of course the more stealthy assassin style of gameplay, being able to eliminate foes and confuse them with shadow stepping. The Engineer is very unique in its own right as it uses contraptions, bombs, and other various explosives to do their dirty work. The Necromancer is a light armor caster that summons unholy minions and curses foes to get the job done, whereas the Elementalist uses the powers of earth, fire, water, and air to devastate foes. Lastly, we have the Mesmer, which is another incredibly unique class as it uses mental manipulation and illusions to cause immense damage and trickery. I've included a video in the description that goes in depth with all nine of these classes so that you can make a better informed decision with picking your class. Your first login is going to be this screen. Let's cover what you have here first. In the top left, you have your basic menu panel. Your top right will feature your main story, quests, local features, or even seasonal events. Your bottom left is your chat box, and your bottom right is your minimap. The center is your main hub for skills. You have a total of five weapon skills, one heal skill, three utility skills, and one elite skill. The center bubble is your HP, and this feature above your weapon skills, this changes depending on which class you have picked. Over in this section is where you will see any buffs or debuffs, which we call boons and conditions respectively in Guild Wars 2. All right, so let's jump back up and review this menu at the top. The first thing on this list we have is your game menu that opens up your main panel. Options, edit account, support, logout, and exit to desktop. Basically, this is the same for every game, but I'd suggest checking out the options as here you can edit some of your key binding amongst other things. Next is your contacts and looking for group. This shows you not only your particular tag, which is important as it allows you to share this information with other players so that you can join groups, join guilds, and even add friends. But this first panel also shows you your current friends list. Underneath of this is the looking for group panel. This is an excellent way to find and join groups in various forms of content across the entire board of all players. You can break it down to even specific zones that you are looking for assistance in. So make sure 
sure to use this well. Below that is your followers panel, if you have anyone following you in game. And lastly is the blocked account panel. This shows you a list of players that you have blocked because you don't want to talk to them. After that is your hero panel. Now this I will cover immediately following this section as it is quite lengthy. Next we have your inventory, which is just that, showing you your bag space and how many items you can handle. Also at the top there are specific shared inventory slots that are shared amongst all other characters on your account. Inventory management is incredibly important in this game, so this is something I, I would suggest you frequently take a look at. This button right here will definitely help you out. This takes all of your current crafting materials in your inventory and stores them automatically in your account storage section. And you don't have to do a thing other than press the button. This next tab is your mail library. Every time that you receive a piece of mail from either other players or from the in-game NPCs, it will populate here. You can send items, gold, and other various things this way. After this, we have our guild panel, which after you join a guild, this will populate information here, including those who are online, those who are offline, amongst other things. You can be a part of multiple different guilds all at the same time and choose which one you wish to represent here. This also has a feature for your particular guild's guild hall if they have already accessed it and added it to that specific guild. The next panel is the world versus world panel. This will show you the current match, the different areas of world versus world that you can join, as well as if there's any queue for joining that specific zone. Think of world versus world as the wild west of player versus player. Now I'll cover this later in the end game mode section. The next panel below shows you the skirmish details, letting you know the current score of the game of the match that is happening, as well as where each server group is at. You can also view your rewards, your reward track, which progresses automatically as you are participating in World vs. World. Lastly, this button will show you your current rank, as well as where you have allocated all of your current talent points at. I recommend, of course, going for the War Claw and War Gliding Masteries to start, just as a tip, and a few other things. Typically, just getting started, I'd suggest you check out the few links that I've included in the description below about World vs. World, as this will hopefully get you a better idea of this game mode. The next panel is your PvP tab. This is specifically Structured Player vs. Player. Structured Player vs. Player is an equalized 5 vs. 5 game mode that allows you to compete against enemy players. This main tab here will show you how to enter the Heart of the Mists, queue up for unranked player versus player matches or ranked matches if you are the appropriate level. This main panel will also show you your stats over time, what your current rank is, as well as your win-loss record. I will talk about this game mode later down the road, but just know that this is a great place to join in and do some testing. The PvP lobby is a great place to artificially boost your character to max level and test the class for all of its capabilities that you have on your account. These buttons over here will show you your current season ranking, the available upcoming tournaments, as well as your PvP reward track, which feels, again, like World vs. World, out as you participate in matches. This button here will show you your list of missed champions. This really only applies to the Stronghold map, which is only available in unranked mode. These are summoned depending on if you capture specific nodes within that particular match. Lastly, the game browser, which shows you all active custom games that other players have created that you can join. Now, the next panel is very important as this is your wizard's vault. This is essentially your daily system. You can complete various tasks that award you with astral acclaim. The astral acclaim then can be spent on all items in the vault. Some of these can only be purchased once while others can be purchased multiple times. There are daily, weekly, and special tasks to complete to earn the Astral Claim. Now, if you like a specific game mode, such as player versus player, world versus world, or just PvE, you can change your preference to what you want to focus on for your dailies, which is pretty neat. Lastly, there is the Black Line Trading Post. This is essentially the in-game player-driven auction house. Players can purchase and sell various items here for gold in-game. Everything from actual weapons to weapon skins and more. Now you can also exchange some in-game gold for gems here. Gems are the cash shop currency, which is typically spent on purchasing cosmetics as well as convenience items for your account. 
I'll cover this a bit later. Let's get into the hero panel. So when you open up your hero panel, you are met with a number of different buttons and tabs. So let's go ahead and review them all. The equipment tab essentially covers what character customizations and gear outfit will look like. There are multiple different tiers of items and essentially there are blue, green, yellow, orange, pink, and purple. Playing the core story all the way through, you will more likely than not have a few pieces of orange gear called exotics and mostly yellows, which are rares. The pink gear is a bit more difficult to come by. It is ascended gear, which offers the highest stat values available in game. And then of course, purple gear is legendary. Legendary gear have the same stats as ascended, so the highest values that you can get, but you can change their stats, appearance, as well as the in-slotted items for free at will. Crazy, crazy, crazy amounts of convenience. For most content, however, you will only ever really need exotic gear to participate. I've included a link in the description to cover the specific gear stat choices for those who need more information. The equipment sub tab manages all the, your inventory for your particular gear. This can be a great way to filter out specific items by clicking on the current equipped piece of gear, for example, your gloves, and then only showing items in your inventory that can augment that specific gear slot. On this panel, you will also see your various stats, power, toughness, vitality, precision, ferocity, condition damage, expertise, concentration, and agony resistance. The power stat increases your on-hit damage. Your toughness stat reduces your incoming hit damage. Vitality increases your overall health. Precision increases your critical strike chance. Ferocity increases your critical strike damage. Condition damage increases your damage over time effects. Expertise makes your conditions last longer. Concentration increases the duration of your boons, or, or you may know them as buffs from other various games. And Agony Resistance, which is specific to an endgame mode that I will cover later. The panel directly below that is your wardrobe. This allows you to change the appearance of any item that you currently have equipped at the cost of a transmutation charge. These are farmed from various forms of content, but I'll be honest, I mainly get mine from player versus player. Also, again, as a note, legendary gear can change their appearance for free at will. Legendary gear also, once earned, is available for every character on your account who can utilize that particular piece of gear. So if you unlock a legendary sword, every character that can use a sword on your account can have access to that. If your account has access to any outfits, they can be equipped here on any character. Typically, these are very well put together and tend to look very, very nice. And typically these are only ever purchased from the gem store. Dyes are found in a number of different pieces of content and once unlocked are available across your account. You can change the different color schemes of your gear, mounts, and even your skiff for free. As long as you have access to that dye color, you can make it look whatever way you want. Next are your glider skins. This is tied mainly to the Heart of Thorns expansion and these glider skins are mainly found in the cash shop purely cosmetic. Next are your mounts. Now, these are mainly tied to the Path of Fire expansion with some exceptions. You can see all the different mounts you have currently unlocked and their specific skins that they are tied to your account. And again, mostly cosmetic here. Then we have the fishing tab, which is just simply shows the pole, bait, and lore that you have equipped. This is specific to the End of Dragons expansion. Next, we have the Skiff tab, also related to the End of Dragon expansion. This allows you to view and purchase different Skiff skins from the cash shop. The next tab is Novelties. These are non-combat related items earned in-game that make your character do a number of, well, odd things like sitting in a chair, flying a kite, turning into the Monkey King. Then we have the Jade Bot. Now this is again related to the End of Dragons expansion. The Jade Bot has a number of open world features that make it incredibly useful to have. And if you own the End of Dragons expansion, this might be one that you should go and get. You can also purchase Jade Bot skins here as well. Minis are just that, non-combat companions that appear next to your character and typically represent characters from in game. Then we have finishers. Finishers are specific to finishing either a downed player or rarely a downed enemy mob. This tab shows you all the different finishers you currently have earned as well as which ones you can have access to. 
And again, these are purely cosmetic. You can get a number of these from either reward tracks in player versus player or world versus world, or just participating in player versus player. Lastly, we have mail carriers, which are just custom ways to make your mail come in fancier. <laughs> Moving on to the build tab, this shows you different builds that we have specced into and your specific build paths that you currently have equipped. These buttons here can show you the different skills that your weapons will have once you have equipped them. Next to that is your utility skill slots, including your heal skill, your utility skills, as well as your elite skills. The next is your different trait lines that you have access to. And lastly is the build storage that if you have set up, basically allows you to press one button to swap entire builds. The next button here is your training tab. As you level and acquire hero points, this will populate here for you to unlock skills as you go. Towards the bottom, this also covers your elite specializations, which require quite a bit of hero points to fully unlock. These elite specializations are unique ways to change how your character's class plays and are typically tied to expansions, except for, of course, Secrets of the Obscure. Below that is the story journal. This allows you to view all the different stories that your character has access to in their account, including expansions as well as living world seasons. You can jump from one story part to the next here by collecting the story aspect you wish to cover. Next is the crafting tab which shows you your different crafting disciplines as well as the items that you can craft. Crafting can be incredibly useful to create great gear as you are leveling and even eventually when you are max level. The main use of crafting after you've gotten decent gear is to assist on legendary journeys. However, I will stress that is a whole other video on its own. Next is the achievement tab. Basically doing anything in game can earn you achievements and some of these achievements once earned, once unlocked, offer gear, titles, and currencies. There are a metric ton of achievements to complete in this game. So take your time looking through all this. Also, once you hit certain achievement point threshold, you get pretty cool care packages just dropped to you. That's pretty awesome. Lastly, this is your Masteries tab. Masteries are an additional way to level up your character after hitting max. These typically don't do much more than assist you in open world content, such as improving your mounts, gliding, or even unlocking unique vendors for your troubles. You can select which mastery path you wish to work on, but be warned you will also need mastery points which are found out in the open world as well as tied to specific achievements and other various forms of content. So happy hunting. Okay, so now let's talk about the rest of your UI. Depending on your weapon or weapons, you will have five weapon skills. Two-handed weapons are granted all five. A main hand weapon and an offhand weapon will have three and two skills respectively. Now, each weapon skill set will be different depending on the class that you play. If you are using a great sword as a warrior, you will have five completely different weapon skills when compared to a guardian who have their own five unique weapon skills. The healing skill is slotted next and they each have some unique options depending on your build. Same with your utility skills that can be customized to choose any three abilities that you would like. This is also where you might find some of those racial skills that I had mentioned earlier. Lastly, the elite skill, which is usually significantly more powerful than the other skills and typically has a longer cooldown for, of course, greater effect. On either side of your action bar, you have these little pop up menus, including mounts, which are off to your right. If your account, of course, has access to them, cosmetic and novelty items. And then over here is your expansion specific features such as skiffs, fishing and rift exploration. This button right here is your weapon swap. Now this is only available for every class except for the elementalist or the engineer. Those two have their own unique mechanics. Essentially, while you were in combat, every other class can swap weapons for a brand new set of weapon skills that can be used. Then after a short cooldown, you can swap back into your other weapon set. Okay, so in your first experience of the Guild Wars 2 game, it will greatly depend on what race you choose to start, as the tutorial instance will have you fight a big boss as a start. Now, as you move through this, it is fairly simple, meant to teach you a bit of the basics and, of course, beginning your tale. Once you have finished this first instance, you are now plopped into the real world of Guild Wars 2. This means you can interact with all the ambient players around you, not just the new characters that were created in your opening scene. Your starting zone is meant to get you used to the open world here. This game has a great portion 
of beauty that comes just from the open world experience. Lots of vistas to see, renowned hearts, which are basically quests in this game to complete, hero point challenges to take on, as well as other points of interest to see. Your remaining levels up until level 10 will focus on this aspect purely and will have a heavy emphasis on the exploration. Now, once you hit level two, you will get a pop up of new features unlocked as well as what your next couple of levels will unlock for you. I suggest taking your time reading each one of these points as they will teach you critical things about the game, the gameplay and other various mechanics. Also as a note, you can press M and you can see the entirety of Guild Wars 2 in all of its glory. But I also want to make mention that you have access to the other starting areas, meaning if you rolled a char and your buddy rolled a Silvari, you can teleport to Caldean Forest to meet with them and explore together. Now, once you hit level 10, you begin your personal story. As mentioned, this is specific to your choices made during your character's creation. This will be very specific instances tied to your combination of choice and influence, the storytelling of your character. The green arrow will pop up and usually ask you to go somewhere nearby to start the instance and move on from there. I will also stress that while I recommend you doing your story as it helps set up the entirety of the Guild Wars 2 universe, Please know that the story is not mandatory, but I would be remiss to say that it does offer a mess of experience and can level you up pretty quickly. So keep that in mind. Speaking of max level, your journey from here will emphasize each of the zones that you choose to explore. Now, technically, you can gain experience to level up from each zone you are in, even if you vastly out level that specific place. Guild Wars 2 does a great job of changing your current level to match that specific area, so the content is always relevant. As you level, I also stress go for the zones that are specific to your current level, as I feel that they give a little bit more experience and a bit more of a challenge to keep things interesting. You will also get a new set of story missions every 10 levels, and I of course always recommend to do those to move your character's story, as well as grant you a ton of experience for very little time. There are many different paths and zones you can explore, and there is no one right way to do it. And that is the beauty of Guild Wars 2 and what it does great. Go and explore, have an adventure, and figure it out on your own. So getting to max level, which is level 80, is where the true player experience begins. You can literally go into a thousand different directions, depending on the different styles of content that you want to get involved in. And of course, that also depends on what you have access to. So the expansions in Living World Seasons, which are basically DLC mini expansions, are all available only for level 80. That means that you can now jump ship and start any of the other content your character has access to. While this is great, this can also be a bit daunting, so I stress take your time and figure out what you want to do. You will also be able to access your elite specializations, which for all intents and purposes are one of the crowning features of the expansions and the game. I'll take this time now to cover endgame activities so you can make a better decision of what you want to invest your time in. So Guild Wars 2 offers a variety of endgame content that you can spend endless amounts of hours on here, progressing in this game. First, let's cover open world content. As mentioned with all the different expansions and even the Quartirian experience, there is lots of open world content that you can spend your time on. The big ones that players love, especially in open world, is the open world boss metas that features a build up to massive bosses that take dozens of players to bring it down. These have their own mechanics, hard hitting abilities and cool theatrics to say the least. This does not limit the open world experience, however. You can go into many different maps and even have a smaller map-wide meta that features either a unique fight, gathering, or what have you. But just know that there is always something going on even when you're exploring the open world. And many of the major boss fights that you have are actually featured in the core Tyrion experience, not just the expansions. Next is the PvE endgame content. And there are a few ways that PvE can be engaged. The first one is the one that you may have seen during leveling, which are dungeons. These are specific group setting content that are very similar set up and scripted, basically. However, I will say that dungeons are not done quite as often when compared to other forms of endgame content. 
and technically dungeons can be done before hitting max level, so just keep this in mind. Next, when you hit level 80, you will gain access to a whole library of other endgame content, so let's go ahead and talk about the Fractals of the Mists. Fractals of the Mists are small instance style dungeons consisting of groups of 5 players. These dungeons have certain story elements that must be completed to finish, and typically end with a boss fight. Also, just note, some are simply the boss fight, and that's it. Now, depending on the level of the fractal, they scale in difficulty upwards to level 100. The scaling adds certain affects that make the instance run much more challenging. The major scaling modifier, however, is Agony, which is essentially a damage over time effect that deals percent health damage. The higher the Agony, the higher the percent damage you will take. Now, to combat this, we slot Ascended or Legendary Gear with Agony Infusion that add resistance to this damage over time effect. This reduces the scaling damage you take from Agony into bite-sized pieces, making it significantly more manageable. Typically, you get an Agony debuff from taking damage from the various things inside each Fractal. I always recommend getting into Fractals as a start, as they are a fantastic way to get gear and gold in-game. Next, we have Raids. Raids are 10-man instance boss combat that feature a specific wing. These require a good amount of coordination as well as decent amounts of skill to complete. These bosses usually have multiple phases and interesting mechanics that truly offer a challenge. And raiding in Guild Wars 2 also offers a fantastic way to get ascended in legendary gear. To make raiding also more accessible, on a rotation there is a feature called the emboldened mode. This gives up to 100% more health, up to 50% more damage, and up to 50% increased healing output, which builds up after every failed attempt on a boss in that particular wing. Once that boss is defeated, then the stacks are then reset until your group fails against one of the following bosses. To get started, I'd suggest searching for a raid training groups within the Guild Wars 2 communities. Many offer educational ways to get your foot in the door. Also, as a note, raids are included mainly with the Heart of Thorns and Path of Fire expansions. Finally, the last major piece of PvE content is Strike Missions, which are single boss encounters. A decently complex fight from the story of Guild Wars 2 and makes it into a repeatable 10-man instance again, requiring coordination and skill. These Strike Missions typically can offer currencies for unique gear and other various items. Something also to note as well is that some of the raid bosses feature challenge modes, as well as many of the strike missions offer challenge modes, which are basically harder versions of those particular bosses. Strike missions are also exclusive to the Ice Brood Saga, the Living World DLC, the End of Dragons expansion, and the Secrets of the Obscure expansion. Moving on to PvP, there are essentially two different modes, Structured PvP and World vs. World. Structured PvP, or SPvP, is a typical 5 vs. 5 capture and hold type style of contest. In Structured PvP, you have two sub-modes, either Ranked or Unranked. Unranked is just that, non-season recorded matches versus Ranked, which keeps a record of how well you do each season. Now, to join Ranked PvP, you do also need to be PvP level 20 to get started, but the seasonal rewards for Ranked can be a great way to get gear, all the way up to Legendary. Structured player versus player is also equalized, meaning that if you join a match at level 2, you will be boosted to max level and have all of the account-wide features available to you, including any access to elite specializations on that specific account. Your gear is essentially chosen through this amulet, along with your relic, runes, and sigils. Anyone can join Structured Player vs. Player and participate, and I always recommend to give it a go, especially if you want to see what your class can do. The other major PvP mode is World vs. World, and this is widely one of the most popular endgame modes in-game. This is a player vs. player vs. environment style of game, essentially the wild west of player vs. player content. You walk into the mists with whatever gear you have on and essentially good luck. You are tasked to capture towers, keeps, and camps with the help of other players on your server, and it can be incredibly fun, especially if you join in with those other players. This is the limiting factor, however. Even if you are in a guild with lots of players, as it stands you can only join groups with other World v World players from your specific server or the server that you are joined with on that rotation. If you intend on playing World vs World with a friend or a small group of players, I suggest you join a server that they are located to maximize the fun. 
as it is quite challenging to get into World v. World without any friends. World vs. World also can be a great way of getting gear, including legendary gear as well as the exclusive Warclaw mount. Other endgame modes include, but are not limited to, achievement hunting, legendary crafting, roleplaying, mount racing, and map completion, just to name a few. The best part about Guild Wars 2 is that even if you're on working on one of these features, you're still progressing your character, so no worry about a wasting time. Currently, there are four expansions available for Guild Wars 2, as well as quite a bit of DLC. The Heart of Thorns expansion, being the first expansion, has your character traversing the Maguma jungle to hunt down Mordremoth, the jungle dragon. This expansion includes gliding as its major feature, as well as the aforementioned raiding. This expansion also includes the first set of elite specializations ever introduced into the game. Next we have Path of Fire, which is the second expansion introduced to Guild Wars 2, and this takes you to the Elonian Desert to hunt down a disgraced human god. The major feature of this expansion is the mounts that were introduced. This expansion will grant you just about all of the mounts, with the exceptions of the Roller Beetle, the Sky Scale, or the Turtle. This expansion also has the second set of elite specializations that all have a hint of desert flavor tied to them. End of Dragons is the third expansion for Guild Wars 2, and this expansion crosses the sea to the ancient lands of Cantha to find out what the hell all these earth-shaking disturbances are. The major features of this expansion are the fishing, skiff riding, which is your boat, as well as the jade bot. The expansion also includes the latest set of elite specializations that emphasize the use of Canthan power to augment their classes. The Secrets of the Obscure expansion is the fourth and most recent one that takes us to the northwestern section of the Maguma jungle where we discover the secrets of a long obscured order of interdimensional wizards. This expansion's major features are the use of the sky scale, rift hunting, and then the weapon master training which allows all class builds to be able to utilize each of the elite specializations weapons. This is also the most current form of continent. So if any additional content is included in the game, you will also get this as it comes out. Now, the Living World Seasons sew the stories of the major expansions together, and each in their own individual right offer a great story, new maps, and some pretty long-lasting features. For example, Living World Season 4 can offer the Roller Beetle and the Skyscale mount, as well as a legendary amulet. Not to mention the best bit of storytelling in-game. That's, that's just me. <laughs> These are great to have, but I wouldn't say that they're absolutely necessary. So Guild Wars 2 has an in-game cash shop that offers a ton of different items and cosmetics, however they are just that, convenience and beauty. Many of the items here increase bag space, offer faster travel, amongst other things. Now you purchase these items using gems, now gems can be used with real life currency or they can be exchanged from gold in game. So if you earn enough in-game, you can exchange them for gems to purchase other features that you may like. As I wrap up this beginner's guide, I want to include some tips that I have learned in my time playing this wonderful game. First, Guild Wars 2 is meant to be a casual game. Many features of this MMO emphasize taking your time and taking breaks, so don't try to rush it. You won't have a good time. Second, Guild Wars 2 mostly is a game that features horizontal progression. That means a lot of what you earn on one character is shared with other characters, and there really isn't much of a gear treadmill. Essentially, you earn gear that holds its value forever, incentivizing working on Ascended and Legendary gear as an optional quest, not a major pushing feature. But even then, their effectiveness isn't that much more between Exotic gear and Ascended and Legendary. Lastly, there is no one right way to play this game. Game. This is a customization gold mine for many different players, not just talking about the builds in game, but what you spend your time on. Many things do not need to be completed, but you do reap the reward if you do. If all you want to do is play player versus player, you can do that. If all you want to do is just open world events, go ahead, have a great time. Truth be told, that's the most beautiful thing about this game, it's just you can do whatever you want and you're still just as valid. Now, this was all quite a bit, and I hope that it does help. If you want to see some other new player mistakes that I have made in my Guild Wars 2 journey, click this video here. As always, stay caffeinated, folks.